Good morning, everyone. I feel very excited to be here with us this morning. And what I want to share with us is something very simple, yet extremely profound. I know many of us have been told from when we were kids in primary school and in nursery school, we were told that we're leaders of tomorrow. And that's the biggest lie that I think I've been sold for over 2019 years, because we are the leaders of today. So what I want to share with us today, I'm sharing, assuming that I'm talking to the people who have the capacity to make the impact and to create the change and the transformation that we desire. This morning, I want to share with you my economic formula for a better Africa. And it is a concept that I did not develop on my own, but a product of research that uh, took place from 2015 to 2018. And it's going to completely reshape your mind in a very simple way, but in a very profound way also. I want us to make a count right now. We just did one. Can we go together? Two, three, four. Louder? Five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. And let us count again. One, three, louder, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, and fifteen. And this shows us what is possible when there is an arrangement with data. This is what is possible when there's an arrangement with resources. We're able to use the same time, the same resources, the same material to create a complete picture that is beautiful. And with the same material, with the same resources, and with the same time, we're creating something that is not beautiful. And this is our story as a people. Between 1939 and 1945, it created the civilization that we have today. And we have the first set of people who were called the Western Bloc. These persons believed that capitalism and democracy were the instruments that would provide civilization in the best way for people. And these persons were called, in those times, the first world. Then we also had the second set of persons called the Eastern Bloc. And these individuals were people who believed that socialism and communism were the instruments that would provide us civilization in the best sense. And this set of people were called the second world. And then we had another set of persons who had no clue as to what was happening in the world. They don't understand what was going on and they had no plan for their own civilizations. And these persons were called, okay, I think let's try and quickly get to that place. All right. Okay, good. Now these were the second words. Then we have the third set of persons who all together put together were called the third words. And this problem that put us in this category is a problem we still serve to you today. We don't have an understanding as to what is the path we want to create to produce the kind of civilization the kind of uh, transformation we desire in our continent, in our countries, and in our societies. In a simple word, we say that we don't have any plan, and we're just flowing with whatever the current provides for us. So right now, I want us to look at this. This is our country, Africa, and we've been jumping from different place to place. And in our community, like a boy state like this, it has also been the same. These 23 years of the state being created, and we don't have a direction. It is just based on whatever administration shows up and they tell us, okay, this is the path we want to go. And it's not helping us. So what do we need? We need to be able to create a path and answer the question as to how do we want to navigate this path? We want to ask ourselves, what do we want to do in the first four years? What do we want to do in the next eight years? What do we want to do in the next 16 years, 32 years? Up to that, we, till we get to that destination we desire as a people. So if you look at this case study, 
people ask themselves, is it socialism or is it capitalism? Some persons will ask you, is it monarchy or is it democracy? And then some persons will ask, is it federalism or confederation? And for me, the answer is not any of this. Because we don't create people for systems. We create systems to suit the people. So we don't want to impose any of this on any community. Like we've seen what happened in Libya. Libya may not have been the best country or may have been enjoying the best of themselves. But we can see that what was imposed on them or suggested to them for the world is not what is helping them as a country today. So my suggestion is that every system that should be created should be created to fit the culture of a people, to fit the understanding of a people, and to fit the society that it is being created for. So when we look at this, there are five steps that we were able to distill from our research that any person can use. The universal laws, it can be applied at a national level, it can be applied at a state level, it can also be applied even at local levels. And even we as individuals could even apply these same principles and we'll see our lives advance in a very profound way. So what are these laws or what are these principles we've been able to distill? The first and most important is the fact that nations that we're able to go for were nations that we're able to craft an inclusive, long-term economic development roadmap. And the two words important there are inclusive and long-term. So I'll give you an instance. Let's say a Boeing state will decide to tell ourselves that in the next four years, and this will happen with a leader who is able to do what Sun Yishat did for China, who is called the father of modern China. He is able to gather all the stakeholders, and I'll use a Boeing state as an instance, the governor is able to put all together everybody whose voice matters in this state, including you and I. But starting from the top persons and getting to the list. And we'll ask ourselves, in the next 40 years, where do we want to be as a state? In the next eight years, do we want to achieve a state that has at least 22 hours of electricity out of 24 hours? We'll have achieved that. What next do we want to achieve? Do we want to achieve an education system that is top in the world? After we achieve that, do we want to get to industrialization? After we achieve that, where next do we want to be? And these entire stakeholders are able to come to this agreement and an arrangement such that it is independent of any administration. Whoever comes into power follows the same direction. What this is going to create for us is a kind of leadership that is called one man or one mind long-term leadership. It's important. So in a country like Dubai, you see that there's one man in power who have done amazing things for a long period of time. In a place like Singapore, you see a man like uh, Lin Kuan Yun, who was able in 35 years to move Singapore from a third world to a first world. But let's say in our country like Nigeria, we don't have that privilege or we don't want that setting where one man is in power for 30 years. The only way to also achieve this one mind long-term leadership is because we've been able to use laws in our local assemblies, state assemblies, national assemblies, to establish that one of the major premises for impeachment is any leadership or any administration that is not able to stick to the long-term plan of the state. There are many things that could be built around this, but when this is established, we've made a major progress. The next stuff that is going to be important is to begin to identify and eliminate what I call DLFs. So what are DLFs? DLFs are development limiting factors. For instance, in a Boeing state, one of our biggest development limiting factors is that outside this community, people think a Boeing state is backward. People think that nothing excellent can come out of this environment. As a matter of fact, one of the good friends I made within the past few weeks told me that when she was sent to this town to serve as a co member, she was told never to buy meat in the market because those are human parts that were being sold in those places. Because the Abakaliki person kill people on a daily basis. This is a very big factor and is limiting us as a people from advancing. As a country, we may talk about corruption as a factor holding us down. But corruption is not a problem the way people see it as the way we've been able to distill. Every human being has a tendency to cheat. But when you create an environment that makes cheating difficult, then you find out that corruption can be solved in almost any society.
So we want to develop for every public organization or every public office an excellent public finance management system. Where we've been able to create this, you see that you create an environment that chokes corruption. That way we can distill and point out one after the other what are all the factors limiting us. Why is this so important? If I give you a little keg and it has a big hole under, no matter the amount of water you pour in, it will never get filled. Because if we don't eliminate these factors that are holding us down, no matter how much progress we make, we'll still be at the same spot, if not going backwards. Once we've been able to do this, the next thing is to be able to achieve patriotism. In the last speech by President of the United States, Donald Trump, he said that the future does not belong to globalists, that the future belongs to patriots. And patriotism has two factors. Not just the love for a nation, but you believing in the nation. Many persons here love Nigeria, but not everybody here believes in Nigeria. And that is why we want to loop. So how do we want to achieve this true education and public orientation? If we start from nursery school and primary school to begin to educate our children concerning the Ebony dream in 40 years, and they begin to see what is to be expected of government, and this child grows up to the year 2025, six years from now, and sees that there's electricity in Ebony State 247, you begin to create in this child the ability to believe in the promises of the nation. You begin to create in investors the ability to project and know, okay, we can plan this because this is where the government is going to. It will create two things in the mind of people, not just love for the nation, but their trust and their confidence and their belief in the nation. When we've been able to arrive at this, the last thing we must do is to be able to demand to be respected locally and internationally. And the word there is demand. We don't have to ask for it. We don't have to beg for it. We have to demand for it. And there are two ways to do that, either actively or passively. One of the mistakes I believe that Martin Luther King Jr. made was to demand for civil rights. And when you compare what happened in the US when they rebelled against the United Kingdom, you see that they did not demand for civil rights. They created their own civil rights. One of the ways to demand to be respected is to create something the world depends on you for. Another way to demand for respect is to make bold statements and reject certain things that are being said about us. It is so painful that despite all was said in the last few months about Nigeria, our government did not make any statement to once again establish to the world that a few persons does not define the country as a whole. We must demand to be respected. We have been able to achieve these five simple things. You see that we've been able to move from this to move to a place where we can comfortably say that in one year, can we count? In two years, in three years, in four years, in five years, in six, in seven, in eight, in nine, in 10, in 11, in 12, in 13, in 14, and in 15 years, would have been able to come to a point where we trust, we have confidence, and we believe in the country called Nigeria. Thank you so much.